the mansion by henry van dyke we'll skip this intro and go right to the story there was an air of calm and reserved opulence about the weight man mansion that spoke not of money squandered but of wealth prudently applied standing on a corner of the avenue no longer fashionable for residents it looked upon the swelling tide of business with an expression of complacency and half disdain. The house was not beautiful. There was nothing in its straight front of chocolate colored stone, its heavy cornices, its broad staring windows of plate glass, its carved and bronze bedecked mahogany doors at the top of the wide stoop to charm the eye or fascinate the imagination. But it was eminently respectable and in its way imposing. It seemed to say that the glittering shops of the jewelers, the moliners, the confectioners, the florists, the picture dealers, the furriers, the makers of rare and costly antiques, retail traders in luxuries of life, were beneath the notice of a house that had its foundations in high finance and was built literally and figuratively in the shadow of St. Petronius Church. John Whiteman was like the house into which he had built himself 30 years ago, and in which his ideals and ambitions were encrusted. He was a self-made man. But in making himself, he had chosen a highly esteemed pattern and worked according to the approved rules. There was nothing irregular, questionable, flamboyant about him. He was solid, correct, and justly successful. Harold Waitman had often listened to his father discoursing in this fashion on the fundamental principles of life and always with a divided mind. He admired immensely his father's talents and the single-minded energy with which he approved them. But in the paternal philosophy, there was something that disquieted and oppressed the young man and made him gasp inwardly for fresh air and free action. At times during his college course and his years at law school, he had yielded to this impulse and broken away, now toward extravagance and dissipation, and then, when the reaction came, toward a romantic devotion to work among the poor. He had felt his father's disapproval for both of these forms of imprudence, but it was never expressed in a harsh or violent way, always with a certain tolerant patience, such as one might show for the mistakes and vagarities of the very young. Father played us, said Harold, in a moment of irritation to his mother, like pieces in a game of chess. My dear, said the lady, whose faith in her husband was religious, you ought not to speak so impatiently. At least he wins the game. He is one of the most respected men in New York, and he is very generous, too. I wish he would be more generous in letting us be ourselves, said the young man. He always has something in view for us and expects to move us up to it. But isn't it always for our benefit, replied his mother. Look what a position we have. No one can say there is any taint on our money. There are no rumors about your father. He's kept the laws of God and man. He's never made any mistakes. Harold got up from his chair and poked the fire. Then he came back to the ample, well-gowned, firm-looking lady and sat beside her on the sofa. I feel like a hired man in the service of this magnificent mansion, say, in training for father's place as major domo. I'd like to get out some way, to feel free, perhaps to do something for others. The young man's voice hesitated a little. Yes, it sounds like a can't, I know, but sometimes... I feel as if I'd like to do something good in the world if Father would only insist upon God's putting it into the ledger. His mother moved uneasily, and a slight look of bewilderment came into her face. Isn't that the most irrelevant, she asked. Surely the righteous must have their reward. And your father is good. See how much he gives to all the established charities, how many things he has founded. He's always thinking of others and planning for them. And surely for us, he does everything. How well he has planned this trip to Europe for me and the girls, the court presentations at Berlin, the season on the Riviera, 
the visits in England with the Plumptons and the Haverstones. He says Lord Haverstone has the finest old house in Sussex, pure Elizabethan, and all the old customs are kept up too. Family prayers every morning for all the domestics. By the way, you know his son Bertie, I believe. Harold smiled a little to himself as he answered, Yes, I finished at Catalina Island last June with the Honorable Ethelbert. He's a rather decent chap in spite of his ingrowing mind. But you, mother, you are simply magnificent. You are father's masterpiece. The young man leaned over to kiss her and went up to the riding club for his afternoon canter in the park. So it came to pass early in December that Mrs. Waitman and her two daughters sailed for Europe on their serious pleasure trip, even as it had been written in the book of Providence. And John Waitman, who had made the entry, was left to pass the rest of the winter with his son and heir in the brownstone mansion. They were comfortable enough. The machinery of the massive establishment ran as smoothly as a great electric dynamo. They were busy enough, too. John Waitman's plans and enterprises were complicated, though his principle of action was always simple, to get good value for every expenditure and effort. The banking house of which he was the chief, the brain, the will, the absolutely controlling hand, was so admirably organized that the details of its direction took but little time. But there were board meetings of corporations and hospitals, conferences in Wall Street and at Albany, consultations and committee meetings in the Brownstone Mansion. For a share in all this business and its adjuncts, John Waitman had his son in training in one of the famous law firms of the city, for he held that banking itself is a simple affair. The only real difficulties of finance are on its legal side. Meantime, he wished the young man to meet and know the men with whom he would have to deal when he became a partner in the house. So a couple of dinners were given in the mansion during December, after which the father called the son's attention to the fact that over a hundred million dollars had sat around the board. But on Christmas Eve, father and son were dining together without guests, and their talk crossed the broad table, glittering with silver and cut glass and softly lit by shaded candles, was intimate, though a little slow at times. The elder man was in a rather rare mood, more expansive and confidential than usual, and when the coffee was brought in and they were left alone, he talked more freely of his personal plans and hopes than he had ever done before. I feel very grateful tonight, he said at last. It must be something in the air of Christmas that gives me this feeling of thankfulness for the many divine mercies that have been bestowed upon me. All the principles by which I have tried to guide my life have been justified. I have never made the value of this salted almond by anything that the courts would not uphold, at least in the long run. And yet, or wouldn't it be truer to say, and therefore, my affairs have been wonderfully prospered. There's a great deal in that text. Honesty is the best policy. But no, that's not from the Bible after all, is it? Wait a moment. There is something of that kind, I know. May I light my cigar, Father, said Harold, turning away to hide a smile, while you are remembering the text. Yes, certainly, answered the elder man rather shortly. You know, I don't dislike the smell, but it is a wasteful, useless habit, and therefore I have never practiced it. Nothing useless is worthwhile. That's my motto. Nothing that does not bring the reward. Oh, now I recall the text. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. I shall ask Dr. Snodgrass to preach a sermon on the verse some day. Using you as an illustration? Well, not exactly that, but I could give him some good material from my own experience to prove the truth of Scripture. I can honestly say that there is not one of my charities that has not brought me in a good return either in the increase of influence, the building up of credit, or the association with substantial people. Of course, you have to be careful how you give in order to secure the best results. No indiscriminate giving, no pennies in beggar's hats. It has been one of my principles always to use the same kind of judgment in charities 
that I use in my other affairs, and they have not disappointed me. Even the check that you put in the plate when you take the offering up the aisle on Sunday morning? Certainly, though there the influence is less direct, and I must confess that I have my doubts in regards to the collection for foreign missions. That always seemed to me romantic and wasteful. You never hear from it in any definite way. They say the missionaries have done a good deal to open the way for trade, perhaps, but they have also gotten us into commercial and political difficulties. Yet, I give to them a little. It is a matter of conscience with me to identify myself with all the enterprises of the church. It is the mainstay of social order and a prosperous civilization. But the best forms of benevolence are the well-established organized ones here at home where people can see them and know what they are doing. You mean the ones that have local habitation and a name? Yes, they offer by far the safest return, though of course there is something gained by contributing to general funds. A public man can't afford to be without public spirit. But on the whole, I prefer a building or an endowment. There is a mutual advantage to a good name and a good institution in their connection in the public mind. It helps them both. Remember that, my boy. Of course, at the beginning, you have to practice it in a small way. Later, you will have larger opportunities. But try to put your gifts where they can be identified and do good all around. You'll see the wisdom of it in the long run. I can see it already, sir, and the way you describe it, it looks amazingly wise and prudent. In other words, we must cast our bread on the waters in large loaves carried by sound ships marked with the owner's name, so that the return freight will be sure to come back to us. The father laughed, but his eyes were frowning a little as he suspected something irreverent under the respectful reply. You put it humorously, but there's sense in what you say. Why not? God rules the sea, but he expects us to follow the laws of navigation and commerce. Why not take good care of your bread, even when you give it away? It's not for me to say why not, and yet I can think of cases. The young man hesitated for a moment. His half-finished cigar had gone out. He rose and tossed it in the fire in front of which he remained standing. A slender, eager, restless young figure with a touch of hunger in the fine face, strangely like and unlike the father, at whom he looked with half-wistful curiosity. The fact is, sir, he continued, there is such a case in my mind now, and it is a good deal on my heart, too. So I thought of speaking to you about it tonight. You remember Tom Rollins, the junior, who was so good to me when I entered college? The father nodded. He remembered very well indeed the annoying incidents of his son's first escapade and how Rollins had stood by him and helped to avoid a public disgrace and how a close friendship had grown between the two boys so different in their fortunes. Yes, he said, I remember him. He was a promising young man. Has he succeeded? Not exactly. That is, not yet. His business has been going rather badly. He has a wife and little baby, you know. And now he has broken down, something wrong with his lungs. The doctor says his only chance is a year or 18 months in Colorado. I wish we could help him. How much would it cost? Three or four thousand, perhaps, as a loan. Does the doctor say he will get well? A fighting chance, the doctors say. The face of the old man changed subtly. Not a line was altered, but it seemed to have a different substance, as if it were carved out of some firm, imperishable stuff. A fighting chance, he said, may do for speculation, but it is not a good investment. You owe something to young Rollins. Your grateful feelings does you credit, but don't overwork it. Send him three or four hundred if you like, but you'll never hear from it again, except in the letter of thanks. But for heaven's sake, don't be sentimental. Religion is not a matter of sentiment. It's a matter of principle. The face of the younger man changed now, but instead of becoming fixed and graven, it seemed to melt into life by the heat of an inward fire. His nostrils quivered with a quick breath, his lips curled. Principle, he said. You mean principle and interest, too. Well, sir, you know best whether that is religion or not. But if it is, count me out. 
Tom saved me from going to the devil six years ago, and I'll be deed if I don't help him now to the best of my ability. John Waitman looked at his son steadily. Harold, he said at last, you know I dislike violent language, and it never has any influence with me. If I could honestly approve of this proposition of yours, I'd let you have the money, but I can't. It's extravagant and useless. But you have your Christmas checks for $1,000 coming to you tomorrow. You can use it as you please. I never interfere with your private affairs. Thank you, said Harold. Thank you very much. But there's another private affair. I want to get away from this life, this town, this house. It stifles me. You refused last summer when I asked you to let me go up to Grenfell's mission on the Labrador. I could go now at least as far as the Newfoundland station. Have you changed your mind? Not at all. I think it is an exceedingly foolish enterprise. It would interrupt the career that I've marked out for you. Well then, here's a cheaper proposition. Algie Vanderhoof wants me to join him on his yacht with, well, with a little party, to cruise in the West Indies. Would you prefer that? Certainly not. The Vanderhoof said is wild and godless. I do not wish to see you keeping company with fools who walk in the broad and easy way that leads to perdition. It is a rather hard choice, said the young man with a short laugh, turning toward the door. According to you, there's very little difference, a fool's paradise or a fool's hell. Well, it's one or the other for me, and I'll toss up for it tonight. Heads I lose, tails the devil wins. Anyway, I'm sick of this, and I'm out of it. Harold, said the older man, and there was a slight tremor in his voice. Don't let us quarrel on Christmas Eve. All I want is to persuade you to think seriously of the duties and responsibilities to which God has called you. Don't speak lightly of heaven and hell. Remember, there is another life. The young man came back and laid his hand upon his father's shoulder. Father, he said, I want to remember it. I try to believe in it, but somehow or other in this house, it all seems unreal to me. No doubt all you say is perfectly right and wise. I don't venture to argue against it, but I can't feel it, that's all. If I'm to have a soul either to lose or to save, I must really live. Just now, neither the present nor the future means anything to me. But surely we won't quarrel. I'm very grateful to you, and we'll part friends. Good night, sir. And I think we'll pause here, and we'll continue with this story in the next video. Please make sure you reach down, click like, and subscribe. And remember, I love you guys. And as Tigger says, ta-ta for now.